because he's so afraid you'll catch on to what I'm going to be preaching about today. He's very nervous that this will touch home. And uh, I'm just going to partner with you, okay? And I won't be looking at other things that bother me. I'll look at you. you. You partner with me today? Sure. Father, right now, we agree. No distractions. Word of God's going to come through, and we're going to receive everything you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. Praise God. Okay, I want to talk to you, and I'm going to begin going to the 91st Psalm. Psalm 91 is probably one of my favorite psalms. I know it's my favorite. I read it all the time. In fact, I try to read it practically every day. And, I, and what I love about Psalms 91 is it's become so personal to me. It's personal in that I like to replace the words with my name. You know, like I'll say, we. Like Carl and I will read it. Now, if I do one, verse 1, I'll say, we that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's how I read it. But I want to go down to verse number 9 and 10. Uh, but I, before you read that along with me, let me read for you 7 and 8 also. Well, maybe 6, 7, and 8, and then we'll do 9 and 10 together. Nor the pestilence that walketh in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Now look at this. A thousand shall fall at your side, and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. Now look at verse 9. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. Now today I'm going to be talking about building a wall of joy around your house and your life. In other words, making your place a safe place. Now, in the Passion Translation, in verse 10 it says, How then could evil prevail against us, or disease infect us? Now he's talking about how that we can... If we make God who God's supposed to be, we make the Lord our refuge, our habitation, then there is no spiritual attack that's going to prosper, and there's no physical attack. The passion, see what, how passion said, how then could evil prevail, that's spiritual, or against us, or any disease infect us. And church, I don't know if you've been hiding in a barrel somewhere, but the media is trying to inflict our nation with fear. I understand there has always been something floating in the air. But right now, they're working very hard to make us so afraid my son was going, he's planning, he's still planning right now, planning on flying over to Japan. He said, Mom, will you check and see if they have any of those little masks, you know. Dustin was going. Who did I say? Yeah, Brandon's going to stay here. Sorry, Brandon, you, you don't get to go to Japan. It's Dustin. Isn't it weird? You've got three kids and you always mix their names up. If I only had an only child, I might mix his first and last, middle name up. I don't know. But the thing is, and Carla went on Amazon. What was some of those prices, dear, for a mask? $500. For a seven or eight dollar mask. Why? Because they, people are so afraid and people will pay it. But you know what? The greatest attack that you will ever face, the greatest danger to the child of God is not a virus that's floating through the air. The greatest dangers we face are spiritual in nature. And see, we've got to decide because here's the thing, God wants to heal you from the inside out. And God wants to protect you on the inside. And if your inside's ready, then you can face whatever. And we didn't understand. You know, I was thinking, they, they, they put, uh, I, I said to Dustin, I said, what is it that's all this is, what's, what's to this story of coronavirus? He said, well, well, first of all, Dad, you just don't go places that you could get infected. Don't go to the wrong places. Don't go to China, right? Don't mix and mingle with the wrong people. You'll catch something from them. Wash your hands a lot. 
Even wear a mask if you need to. And I thought, well, that almost coincides with being a fired up, spirit-filled Christian and staying safe spiritually. There's just some places we don't want to go. Hey, I want to dwell in the I'm like David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. He wrote again, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, when we understand there's a right places to be and there's a wrong places to be. You want to stay on top of things spiritually, you've got to kind of be picky where you hang out. There are certain people. Bless their heart, you love them, but when you get around them, they stretch you in the wrong direction. And they pull you down instead of pull you up. Remember the, in, in the scripture where it talks about iron sharpening iron? You don't want somebody going to dull you spiritually. You want to hang around people going to build you up. He talked about wash, what? Washing your hands. The Bible refers to the washing of the water of the Word. And when we put the Word of God in us, and I'll talk about that more in a minute, it'll clean us up. But then, of course, what, what's the mask? Well, we got the whole armor of God. When we begin to do those things, we protect our spirit. But there's nothing going to protect you like keeping your joy tank full. Nothing protects you like keeping your... And so today, I want to show you three little verses real quick. Over in John chapter 15, verse 11. Look what Jesus says. He says, These things have I spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. John 16, 24. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4. And these things, now John says the whole reason I'm writing this letter, 1 John was written for one thing, that your joy may be full. God wants you to have a full joy tank. He wants your spirit full of the joy of the Lord. Remember we said, what's the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. How do we... Keep a full joy tank. How do you keep your pla- yourself in a place to where your joy is so strong? Remember we talked it week after week, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, I'm going to go back to the 15th chapter of John one more time. John chapter 15, verse 1, 2, and 3. And we're going to start with verse 1. Now listen to what Jesus says. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. The King, old King James says, the Father is the husband man, or the vine dresser. Now, if we're going to have a full joy tank all the time, we've got to have an active pursuit of divine knowledge. Always trying to get closer, get more filled, get filled up with the Word of God and knowledge of God. And God reveals so much in this verse. Now look at how he puts it. Because in this verse, there is some revelation that talks about the Savior and the Father. And they really expose us to who Jesus is and to who the Father is. Now notice what he says, because if you don't understand Jesus, so many times people get in a mess because they really don't have an understanding of Jesus. And at other times they have a me- get in a mess because they don't really understand the Heavenly Father. Because too many people try to compare a Father in Heaven to maybe the Father they had. And as we know, in this world there's been a whole lot of folks that have failed as fathers in the natural. The Father of Heaven hasn't. Now let's look at what he says about Jesus. Jesus says, I am the true vine. Jesus says he is the vine. Now, what does that? This is a metaphor. This is it's symbolic. But he's referring to, and later we talk about, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He's saying that I'm the vine. I am where all life comes from. See, he is the life giver. And he is the one who brings life to us. He is our life source. And he is our source. He is our door. Remember, he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. we got to go through Jesus. And I think it's time for the church to have a brand new revelation of who Jesus Christ is. He's everything. He is everything to us. He's the vine. And if we don't have Christ, we don't have anything. But he says the Father is that vine dresser. What's that mean? 
the Father, God the Father says, Jesus says, He's assumed care for the vineyard. Now, all life flows out of Christ. We pray in the name of Jesus. We worship in the name of Jesus. But the Father, He is that one who keeps everything under control. He works on the vine. He, brought, he watches over the vine. He protects the vine and the whole vineyard. See, our fathers, he's active. And when we understand that then, and we're open, we say, I want to keep my joy. Here, I got to keep my joy tank full because the more I know, see, there's joy that flows out of the presence of understanding and knowledge. And when we understand who God is and what he's doing for us, it changes everything. So how do we keep our joy tank full? Never stop learning. Paul's one lesson, he says to Timothy, study to show thyself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. As you continue to learn, and as you continue to get to know God, you find out to know him is to love him. To know him is to trust him. To know him is to honor him. And, and, and see, I think sometimes we don't understand one of the greatest ways to become a true worshiper is to get to know who you're worshiping. Because when, as you begin to know God, that's the one thing that, that I can tell you. That birth, you know, a lot of folks get all sad about the birthdays and, you know, and they say, oh, I'm getting old or this or the other. But what I can tell you, the longer I live, I have accumulated more and more knowledge. And I've had more and more testimonies. And, and, and there's, there's no substitute for experience. And there's no substitute for just time. And, and time's the only way you're going to get it. And living longer and getting to know Him more and digging in the Word. And you find yourself beginning to know God. And it brings a joy because the more I know about Him, the more I know He is able to do whatever I ask Him. He's able. How do I keep my joy tank full? Continue to pursue the knowledge of God. Secondly, how do you keep your joy tank full? There must be in your life a willingness to be touched by God. I can tell you that too many people do not understand that. Because a lot of folks, and not you, but other people, they go to church like going to the movies. Offering is their ticket. They sit there and they enjoy the show. And then when the show's over, they leave. You know... But I tell you what, church is more than just a place to gather around, hear some good preaching, some good singing, and, and see some people you hadn't seen since last week. Joy is a place to be touched by the hand of God. And he, he tells us something in verse 2. I want to read that to you, and I'm going to explain some stuff. And in fact, I'm going to be sharing with you three, three facts every Christian needs to know. He's, look at this. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Let me read it one more time. This is Jesus talking about what the Father does. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, here's these three facts, and these are real important. And if you don't know this, you'll, you'll get confused about things every once in a while. Fact number one, God the Father is continually working on his vineyard. He's a working God. Now, you say, what's that mean to me? He's continually working in your life. See, God doesn't just save your soul from hell and then just throw you off to yourself. But God is continually working in your life. He uses people. He uses ministry. He uses all the. He, he uses angels. He is at work all the time, and what He's doing is He is making you better. And here you got to understand, God's going to be working on you. How many of you know you don't get saved full grown? Babies don't get birth full grown, and a person who gets born again does not get born again full grown. There is a growth process, and there is interaction, and God will be continually. He is always working on us. 
And when we understand that God's at work, and God works through the eyes of love, and all that He is doing is to make you better, He's going to be working on you. But how? So since He's always working, here's the second thing you've got to know. Every Christian needs to know this. So don't be surprised if you feel like God's working on you. He is going to be working on you. The second thing you've got to know, God will not hesitate to remove any fruitless practice or part of your life because he loves you so much that he will not let death or dying live in his kids. See, he's not just working. He's working on you to remove stuff that's holding you back. And I understand when you come to God, you usually come to God with baggage and stuff. And we go to the altar and we say, Jesus, come into my heart, make me your child, and love me, and be my Jesus, and be my God. And, do, and we'll say things like, do what you got to do, God. I, just work on me, whatever you got to do. And when you say that, God takes you seriously. I was talking to Stephen uh, this morning, and, and he just had a surgery, gallbladder, right? Got the gallbladder removed. Anyone else ever had that happen to you? Man, it's a common thing. It's going around. I still got mine. But he got his took out. And he says, what was it? You said, Friday I started feeling like it didn't hurt. But then you, you ate some pizza, right? That's what you told me. And he said, I've heard from people that pepperoni doesn't work too well with folks that's had gallbladder surgery. Now, I don't know. I, 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 so far, pepperoni is working good with me. It's no problem. I'm doing well with pepperoni. Mushrooms, ham, sausage, all that stuff. Extra cheese, it's working good. But he said, oh, did he ever find out that it might not work? Now, the reason they did what they did is your gallbladder just got in the way of your life. And, and if you kept it, it wasn't going to be too good. So they got it out of the way. And, and, but there's things that go with that. He, I, I was there at the hospital. He'd had the surgery, and it was over, and it was a success. But he didn't say, let's go run a few laps around the hospital. No, he's kind of like, of course, I don't see Stephen in his healthiest days running a lap around anywhere. Nothing personal, Steve. I love you, brother. But, you know, Sle Steve's just kind of slow-moving Steve. Steady as a rock. I'm looking for the day the Holy Ghost gets on him and he dances around the front and they go, we know that's a miracle because that had to be God. That's not his personality. But see, the doctors saw that that gallbladder had to get out of his life because it's messing him up. Can I tell you, the Father looks down and he sees things in our life and he says, that's not producing fruit in their life. That's not helping them. That's tearing them down. That's ruining their life. And don't be surprised God might do a little spiritual surgery on you. Getting that dead stuff out of you. Getting that death off of you. Things that are dragging us down. And here's the thing. He's not mad at you. He's not out to get you. He's not a mean, mean God. He's a good, good God. Some of you say, Pastor, you can be hard sometimes. I can be, but it's not because I'm mad at you or, or, or a God of vendetta for you. I have a vision of where I know God wants to put this church, and I have a vision where I know where God wants to take you. And some of you are never going to get there playing games, playing on your phone during preaching, goofing around, living a gossiper's life, all that stuff. You're never going to get there till you say, Jesus, get a hold of my life and transform me and touch me by your Holy Ghost and make me the person you gave me life to have. God wants to transform us. And see, I'm not a mean pastor because I want you to be excelling in God. I love you so much that I might make you mad to help you out. But I want you to get better. I want you to grow. I want you to become everything God called you to be. And that's, so God's going to pull out the old surgical knife. It cuts some things out of your life that you've enjoyed having for a long time. You just thought it was, you, you just thought you couldn't live without it. But he says, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, you take, there's things God's just going to take away. 
But listen to this third thing. He also, he not only just, God will not hesitate to cut you up a little bit, but he also prunes our lives for the purpose of making us better. Now, because look at this. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Why? Because he's mad at it? No. That it may bear more fruit. When I was living in Coloma, we'd bought, we, the church had bought a beautiful parsonage for us, and it was right across the street from an apple orchard. And those, those trees look so full and pretty. And I thought, man, they look so good. I'd look out my front window and see them, all them beautiful trees. And one day, I, they didn't call and ask my permission or nothing. Of course, it wasn't my field. But all these guys came into town with clippers and mini chainsaws. And they started cutting on them beautiful apple trees that were so full and pretty. And I mean, it looked like they were trying to kill them. They was chopping off limb after limb. And some of those trees, when they got finished, it didn't look like there's hardly any tree left. And I thought to myself, why would they do a stupid thing like that? They're trimming it for a reason when they just. If you don't prune it, there'll be limbs that grow that actually stop it from producing as much fruit. They knew what they were doing. And who do you think they learned that from? They learned it from the Father in heaven. Who He says, those that... See, God's going to take stuff out of your life that's hurting you. And then you say, I'm just beginning to, to have some fruit. And things are just beginning to get good for me. And what God then God starts pruning some more. And you're thinking, wait a minute. I'm praying more than I ever prayed. I'm giving more than I ever gave in the offering. I'm serving in the church more than I ever served in the church. And the Lord starts working on you even more. And says, I want you to cut out this. And I want you to cut out that. Here's what you'll learn about prayer. The more you pray, the more you'll realize how much you need to pray. You know, you say, guess what, Pastor? I'm going to pray 15 minutes a day. Oh, are you ever a spiritual giant? I love you for that. I'm going to pray 50. You know what will happen? You start praying 15 minutes a day. It'll dawn on you that 15 minutes isn't enough. How many of you only watch 15 minutes of television a week? You're not a TV person. I'm talking about real TV people. My wife will tell you, you give me some episodes. I, I can binge watch Andy Griffith and seen every one of them. Over, I, I've watched Barney and the Choir a hundred times and I still laugh. Just, as, just like I saw it the first time. I can, I, 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 she's got to work on me. I've been watching this show called How Gun Will Travel. Black and white. A guy named Paladin. She calls him Palomino. She says, you're watching Palomino again. I said, honey, I can't help it. He, 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 he can do more in 30 minutes than most people can in an hour and a half. And even without commercials, it's only about 23 minutes. Black and white, no color. He looks like he's 100 years old, but he's got that fancy holster and pistol. Man, I've been watching it. And I can spend, and I don't mean to, I love the Lord, but I can spend an hour, two hours, all day. All day. Quit helping me preach, brother. <laughs> all day. And it can happen. But how many times do we spend all day in the face of God? All day on our knees. Here's what you'll find out. You spend one day in prayer, and you'll realize that day wasn't enough. You get one, you spend an hour in the presence of God and it'll dawn on you an hour is just not enough. You get in the book and you start digging in the Word and you'll find it, wait a minute, this 15 minutes, these five minutes I used to give God, I need more than five minutes. I, here's what God does. He prunes us and He says, you need to let me get, make you everything you were born to be. See, a lot of people live and die and never touch an inch of their potential of what they could have been. Whew. I'm going to tell you something, you're not going to like this, but as your pastor, I'm going to stretch you. I'm going to stretch you. I'm going to stretch you to be closer to God than you ever thought you could be. 
I'm going to stretch you to pray more than you ever thought you could pray. I'm going to stretch you to love God more than you ever thought you could love God. And here's the thing about it. If, if this goes the way God's leading us, if you could see into the future one year, you would look at that image and go, I'll never get there. That's never going to happen. But then as you begin to grow, you'll look back and you'll think to yourself, on March the 1st, 2020, pastor said he's going to stretch us. And I didn't believe it. And when I saw that vision of what I was going to be, I thought, that will never be me. But here I am. And I'm not just where he thought I was going to be. I've exceeded even more. Yeah. Some of you, 10 minutes on the treadmill is more than you'd ever do in your lifetime, you think. I'm not get and then you catch yourself on there an hour and a half. You say, I, I'm not going to do a push-up. I can't do a push-up. And then you find yourself doing 100 a day. God knows how to stretch us. And here's what it is. The more fruitful you get, the more work he's going to do. You say, well, then I, I don't want to be fruitless. Fruit, I, won't, I, I don't want fruit. I'll just be fruitless. No, you don't want to be that. Because one day, we will all stand before God and account for every minute that we had on this earth. We will actually, he says, you even account for the idle words you say. So I want to stand before God. You know what I'm really hoping to hear him say? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And, and I want him to say, I don't want him to say, oh yeah, you, you had a church and you pastored that church, but you just tickled their ears and told them what they wanted to hear and you babysit them and you was real sweet to them and you let them all become fat and lazy and they didn't do anything for me. I don't want to hear that. I want to see you become a, march, a marching army that the devil gets nervous you're about to wake up. Yeah. The demons of hell are they're walking the floor of hell going, oh no, Jeff's alarm's about to come on. He's going to wake up in about five minutes. Oh, what are we going to do? He's going to get up and he's going to kick our teeth out all day long. Oh man, I wish he'd sleep an extra hour. I want the demons that patrol this city on Saturday night to have an all-night hell party. Said, oh no, they're going to have church in just a few more hours. Those North Point people are going to wake up in the morning and they're going to go to church and they're going to get fired up and we're going to lose ground. We've already lost street after street after street. We've lost neighborhood after neighborhood after... Oh, we've, lo we've lost family after family. All those mean, horrible people are now praising God and getting born again and singing for Jesus. What are we going to do? It's almost church time over at North Point. And they're going to find out the little petty things they used to send our direction. Don't work no more. Because we got full grown... You know, you know, there used to be a saying, I heard it was a kid. They say, that's as easy as taking candy from a baby. I had a pretty strong grip on candy when I was a baby. I really like candy. You don't have to help too much, Jeff. <laughs> but see, the devil, on some folks, it's been easy because God's people had never grown past the baby stage. But as, oh, when we start getting strong in the Lord, and he starts saying, man, I used to be able to just send one little rumor their way, and it'd be up three or four days, couldn't sleep. Now I'm, I send a hundred demons and march up and around their house, and they just say, oh, get out of here, you bunch of losers. They just got so strong, nothing stops them. That's God's plan. See, he, he, he prunes our lives all for the purpose of making us better. So here's what I say. Joy flows out of the presence of knowing who God is. Secondly, joy builds and grows inside us as we recognize the good things that God is doing. Oh, yeah. See... When we don't see the end result, we start saying, oh, I'm just not so happy. Oh, Lord, pastor didn't shake my hand Sunday. I feel so slighted. No, it's because he's down around the altar praying. He's hitting out the door like the building's on fire. 
I can't always chase you down and catch you. So I, I've been in church. If you've ever worked on an hourly job on Friday at that last horn, people leave like the, oh, man, they're running. They go in Monday like, oh, God, I've got to go in that place. But they leave out Friday like, oh, boy, they're handing out $100 bills at the gate. And that's what happens at church sometimes. I call you blessed. You're dismissed. Phew! And they say, nobody ever fellowships with me because they can't catch you. You're so busy running out the door like you, you know, like you can't wait to get gone. Just walk out normal and you'd be surprised how many people say hi and stuff. Amen. The Lord wants to make you better. And there's joy in knowing and recognizing. The, when, when God gives you a glimpse, I loved it. The little sister came up, remember the other day? You came and said, I got to tell you some of the things God's done in me. And if you told me that would have happened in me, I never would have believed it. But let me tell you what Jesus has done. Folks, there is joy in recognizing that God has been busy working in us. Oh, joy comes from that. I think uh, I'll try to preach some of this. I got too many notes, but I'll make it work. Third thing, verse number three. He says, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. For us to really keep our joy tank full, there has to be a full-blown commitment, a serious commitment to his word. Now you say, I've heard all that. But have you ever noticed how Jesus said this? Remember, Jesus was a, a faith man. And Jesus believed what he said, and he said it in faith. And in this verse 3, I want to look at this, and I may just spend a little time here because it's really powerful stuff. You'll like it too if you let it sink in. Jesus says to them, you are already clean. Looking at Judas is sitting in the crowd. He's got Peter who's going to deny him three times. And he says, you are already clean. Jesus was speaking faith over them. And he says, you're clean. You know what, Jordan? If I, back in, uh, when you first got on the team this year, if I said, guess what? I was praying, and the Spirit of the Lord told me that you're going to be state champions this year. You probably would have said, well, I love Pastor. He's a nice guy, but that's a pretty tall order. But guess what? God had it planned. Jesus, now, at, at the looks of those disciples, he still had Judas doing the bookkeeping. No, no offense, uh, Karen, nothing, nothing. <laughs> I'm just picking at her. Judas was his bookkeeper. He had the sons of thunder, James and John, hot-headed as two brothers you ever met in your life. Remember, they're the guys that said, their mama says, when you get to heaven, will you put one of my sons on your right hand and another one of my sons on your left hand? Mama's looking out for her baby boys. Sound like mama. Yeah, make them team captain and co-captains of heaven. He had them sitting there. He had Peter, like I said, the guy that's such a hot head, whew, slices a guy's ear off. Then as soon as it really heat, he's hiding and lying like you don't know Jesus. And he says, you're clean. You're already clean. He's speaking faith. Can I tell you, there's going to be times in your life when you've got to say what the Word says about you and not what your symptoms say about you. You've got to say what God says about his church and not what you see. You say, oh, I'll see there's some folks. No, he said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You've got to be talking revival. Before these altars are full and before this place is exploding with growth, you're already saying, hey, God's promised it and we're receiving it. Amen. He says, you are already clean. And he says, how are you clean? He says, you know what I've done? Jesus says, here's what I've done. I have spoken my word, and my word does not return void to me. It does everything. And even though you aren't perfect yet, God, the, Jesus saw them as clean and perfect. Now, here's what you've been doing wrong. All of us have, I, I, me included. We keep looking in the mirror, and we keep seeing ourselves from our own perspective and measuring ourselves 
to all of our mistakes. Instead of looking at ourselves and say, Jesus, I want to see me the way you see me. See, Jesus sees you perfect because he's already paid the price. You say, well, what's it going to take to get, what does God have to do to heal me? He don't have to do anything else. By his stripes, you were healed. You, he don't have to go back and, oh, he's got to take a few more stripes. I don't know if he got enough stripes for coronavirus. He has already purchased every person's healing. You want to hear this? He's already purchased every person's salvation. You know, when he, when he on that cross and he said, it is finished, he was saying the work is done. Does that mean everybody's saved? No, everybody's salvation has been paid for. <laughs> I was invited to a party here in the future. And they said, and they said uh, you don't have to worry. Everything's paid for. The food's paid for. All the drinks are paid for. It's totally free. Just show up and fill up. Now, does that mean I'm there yet? And if I don't want to go, I'll miss out on the party. But it's already paid for. The room is reserved. The food is already accommodated. Everything's been took care of. All I got to do is show up. Can I tell you? Jesus on that cross did everything to... In, in fact, the Bible refers to him actually becoming sin. Now, Jesus did not ever sin. He just, on the cross, became sin. So that all of ours are gone. And too often, you're looking in the mirror, and you see yourself, and you say, I did this, and I did this, and I failed in this, and I, I fall short in this. And Jesus wants you to look in and say, Jesus cleansed me from this, and he cleansed me from this. And, and, and I'm like, Paul, I am more than a conqueror. I look in that mirror and say, hey, you, hey, Mr. Michael Arp, hey, you. Yep, I see another wrinkle. I don't like it, but you know what? You have won and greater you look in that mirror and you say, and greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And you look at your checkbook and you say, but my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And you may feel that pain and go, oh, that hurts, but by his stripes I was already healed. I, I wanna, Jesus says, you're clean already. And all it took because of the words I have spoken to you. Too many of us underestimate our Bible. Whew. There's a whole host of people in our nation having a problem with some of the things the Bible says because the Bible says some certain things are not right. And they say, well, maybe the Bible's not the guide. I heard, I heard where one guy was saying, well, just whatever Jesus speaks to your heart, regardless of what the Bible says, let me tell you something. The Word became flesh. Jesus is the Word. And Jesus will never speak anything that c contradicts His Word. And there is enough in the Word. And a lot of people say, I wonder why I can't get over this guilt. I wonder why I can't seem to get the victory. How much have you really let the Word sink into you? Maybe a lot. Let it get more. Let it get more. Because here's what happens. Man, a lot. The clock just keeps ticking. The Word of God cleans us. All for the purpose of the great things He wants to do with us. There's something that I noticed when, I, when I'm at the doctor's. Uh, I went with Carla we, just for checkup stuff. You know, they come in. The first thing you do is they sanitize and I've watched enough doctor shows. Now, I've never had a surgery in my life, but I've watched a whole lot of people do them on television. And they, and, they, and they say, scrub me. And they do that scrubbing up. Doctors scrub up, getting themselves ready to do miracles. 
to do unbelievable things. Oh, they go into people and they do heart transplants. They go in and they do brain surgery. They go in and they put brand new kneecaps in people's knees where, where their knees are wore out and hip replacements and all kinds of things. But they never go in till they've scrubbed up. Can I tell you what? The Word of God gets us ready to do glorious things. And see, as long as your Word is just a devotional book to you, it's not going to get you very far. But when, you're, when the Word of God becomes your life manual, and when it becomes your food source, and it becomes your everything, and you find out, hey, I, I tell you what, I don't think I can leave my house without my Bible. Because I just, well, I, he might tell me something while I'm sitting and waiting for the red light to change. The Word, the Word, it prepares you to do things you never thought you could do. And when you let the Word get in you, your joy tank, it starts finding all this stuff. <sighs> What's it say? Word says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Word of God actually renews our thoughts and helps us to think the right things again. I'll tell you what's happened to me. I, I was born into a family that loved me very, very much. But they didn't teach me how to think. I grew up in a region. Grew up in the deep south. They didn't teach me how to think about people. They actually taught me to think that some people's not as important as other people. Things like that. I grew up in a family where worrying is kind of a common thing. Guess what the words had to do? Scrub my mind. Scrub my mind. Clean, renew my mind. And help me to think the right things. See, a lot of you, you may have had somebody tell you you're nothing over and over again. But then when you start reading the Bible and God tells you you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. And you start seeing things in the Word where He says He loves you with an everlasting love. And you think, nobody's ever loved me. And you start reading in the Bible, you find, God loves me. See, you go through things... And people might come up to a good guy like Jeff and say, there's things you can't do, and there's things you, you, you can't do this, you can't do that. And then you hear this preacher say, greatness. And here he's got something on his chain, a cross. Why is your life destined for greatness? Because of what happened on the real cross. And you wear this symbolic cross to remind you and everybody sees it. There is somebody that died on the cross to make Jeff a difference maker in this world. You're not just another person just living on the planet, but you're a difference maker. You're a world changer. And when you begin to understand that, even though you may have heard your whole life, oh, you'll never amount to nothing. You, you're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You're not quick enough. You're, you're not this, that, that, and the other. But Jesus says, you're more than enough because I came in into your life and if I come into your life everything you need is in me see that's what the word does it renews our thinking and 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 guess what I'm here for I'm here to help you think right you say are you trying to take over our lives no I don't want your life I got enough trouble in my own life I'm telling you I'm here to help you think right see the enemy He's trying to steal generation after generation. When I was a young man growing up in the 70s, I know I've, I've preached a little long, but let me land this plane. When I was a young man growing up in the 70s, it was a rough time. In fact, I, I got an email today telling me we're going to have our 45th high school reunion in August. And I remember the people, and, and I thought, do I want to go to that? And the Spirit of the Lord prompted my heart. Say, they need to see who you become. They need to see what God's done in your life. Because you know what they said? It's, they had this thing called class night where they did the class prophecies. And in the class prophecies, they predicted things about people, John. You know what they said about Michael Arp? They said, Michael Arp, after 50 years of working at Newman's grocery store. He's been promoted to the head bag boy. And they thought that's so funny. And I thought, so what do they see with me? That if I work long enough bagging groceries, one day I might be promoted to the head bag boy. You know, I, I want to walk in, not, not with uh, 
a haughty, better than anybody attitude. I just want to walk in and say, well, you know, I quit that job to go off to college. And I finished college, and then I went to graduate school, and I married the most beautiful girl on the planet. She's going to be with me on my arm. Say, I know your wives look old and wrinkled. Look at mine. I got a doll face right here. I've been on Facebook. I got some of the oldest classmates I ever saw. I don't know what happened to them. Cheerleaders and stuff look like they got hit with an ugly stick. I mean, it's pitiful. And I'm going to walk in. I don't mean that mean. That. Bless her poor heart. Okay, if you add that, it's okay. Uh, but what I want to say is, I want to go back to Madisonville to say, let me tell you what. I'm an example of what can happen when Jesus gets in your heart. When you open up to the Holy Spirit. And when you let God, when you let God take over, He gives you stories to tell that sound so fantastic. But it's because you gave God room to be God. Can I tell you, what I'm here to do for you is to help you make room to let God be God in your life. And when he gets the room to be God, you'll be surprised the things he'll do in your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you so much. Woo, hallelujah. For what you're doing in these people. I thank you for what you're doing at this address. Lord, you're, you're making a difference in Midland, Michigan right here through these people. And some of these folks haven't caught it yet, but there's greatness all over them. And all it took was the active, active, active power of the Holy Spirit. Let that happen in Jesus' name. Amen.